All right, welcome to the Young Turks. We've got a lot of stories of official corruption today, uh, unfortunately, but that's uh, what we got going on. But some of them are funny. The first one I think is, uh, in a sense, a hoot, if you will. Speaking of a hoot, uh, we've got a witch on the show, Christine O'Donnell, although she claims she's not. Uh, so that's coming up in a little bit. In the second hour, uh, Anderson Cooper loses it, and it is, uh, that's actually very funny. Uh, new poll numbers out on President Obama, disaster. Rick Perry, speaking of disasters, is creating disasters all over the country, and so is Tom Coburn. And we found the modern day Harriet Tubman. So you're going to be very amused to find out who that is. So let's get started. This story is the perfect example of how our system is totally bought and paid for by the bankers and the corporations in this country. There was a guy by the name of Peter Simonyi who used to work for Goldman Sachs back in 2008. Actually, he got that job after he worked for the Securities and Exchange Commission. After working for the government at the SEC, he stepped down and lobbied everybody at the SEC that he knew in favor of Goldman Sachs. Well, don't worry, he's back to protecting Goldman Sachs within the government now. So he steps down from uh, Goldman Sachs. Where does he go? Well, he winds up on Daryl Issa's committee to do oversight of things like Goldman Sachs and Wall Street. And guess what? He winds up writing a letter. And that letter says, oh, you know what? The government and regulators are just being way too tough on banks like Goldman Sachs, trying to regulate their derivatives and how much margins they need to have. In other words, how much money do they need to have to make a certain derivatives bet. Now that's what collapsed the economy in the first place back in 2008. Nothing is more important than that. And that is exactly what they want to keep taking risks with because that brings them the most amount of money. It also brings us the most amount of risk. What's Daryl Issa doing in government oversight? He's doing the exact opposite. Writing letters to regulators saying, back off, don't do oversight. We want them to do whatever the hell they want. Now what's interesting is Peter Simoni did not sign that letter. Peter Haller did. But wait a minute, why am I saying they're the same guy? Well, let's take a look at the pictures and see if we can tell the difference between Peter Simoni and Peter Haller. Well, you look at that. It appears to be the same damn guy. He officially changed his name when he left Goldman Sachs. And by the way, his job at Goldman Sachs was to influence regulators. He changes his name then becomes a regulator under ISA. ISA, the Republican, of course, doesn't want to regulate uh, the banks at all. He wants to give them whatever they want. Hires Haller, Peter Haller, to go and write a letter to the regulator saying, hey, back off, we don't want any regulation on this. That's how our government works. This kind of fraud and unbelievable corruption is how our government works. So that's why they call the nickname for Goldman Sachs is Government Sachs. They just keep rotating through the government, fixing the laws in their favor. They buy cheap politicians like Daryl Issa, who's nothing but an unbelievable fraud, to go and fix the government for them so they can take those risks. And if the risks blow up, hey, you pay the bill. And people like Issa and Haller and Simonia or whatever he's going to call himself next year love it because they line their pockets with it. Deep and utter corruption. All right, now you think that's bad, and it is. It's as bad as it gets. Well, it, this is becoming now uh, done systematically. There's a, a group called HB Gary Federal. They're apparently a defense contractor. Now, you might have heard of this story before. Uh, Bank of America hired them, and uh, they called them uh, Team Themis to go after people who were. Uh, talking about the WikiLeaks revelations. Now, remember, WikiLeaks was going to do uh, leaks on Bank of America. Bank of America is significantly worried about that. So they hired these guys to go and smear reporters talking about that. One of the guys on the list was Glenn Greenwald of Salon. And uh, so we found out about that. We saw the whole chart. We've shown it to you before on the Young Turks of all the different reporters that they, ta they targeted to smear. This is not uh, speculation. We've got the emails. How do we get it? Anonymous hacked into them as they were trying to hack into the reporters, which was a huge win for Anonymous. I'm so glad that they did that. Now, it wasn't just Bank of America that was planning to do this. In 2010, U.S. Chamber of Commerce planning to do the same thing, planning to spend up to $2 million through Hunton and Williams, which is a law firm that was arranging all of this, to do persona management. 
And one of the things that they would do is not only hack into people's information to get information not just about them, but about their family to try to figure out how to smear them in the press, but also to create fake people that then, you know, God knows what they could do with the fake people that are either uh, infiltrating, that was the main objective, of groups that, like Anonymous, or uh, WikiLeaks, or other groups, or reporters, or progressive groups, in fact, all of these were planned, to infiltrate them so they can get information from them. One of the fake identities that they created was Holly Weber. And now, Holly Weber was just online, and it was a, it, uh, apparently an information, a, a way to try to get information from people pretending that as if they're this girl, Holly Weber. Now, w are there, w did they hire actual people to go out and pretend to be part of these groups? We don't know that yet. But uh, new revelations are that partner companies Palantir, Burico Technologies, described efforts to use social media to hack into computers, find vulnerabilities, and go after organizations, organizations that were critical of the Chamber of Commerce. Because if you go after the Chamber of Commerce, which represents all the multinational corporations trying to influence our politicians and set the rules in their favor, if you go after them or try to investigate them in any way, shape, or form, well, you are targeted for smearing and character assassination. This is what they're up to. Thank God we've got somebody trying to figure it out. Of course, a press, press, press would go after corporations? Of course not. Now, of course, other than a few shows, like when I was on MSNBC and then here on The Young Turks, Dylan Radigan, outside of those shows, how much did this get in terms of press attention? Damn little. I mean, isn't this a major story that they're going to try to smear reporters who are actually trying to do their job, what little reporters there are doing their jobs. Maybe the rest of the press didn't cover it because they were so embarrassed they weren't on the list. Like, oh, you don't have to worry about the major press. No, 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 the big newspapers and the TV stations. Well, obviously they're not gonna talk critically about the Chamber of Commerce or Bank of America or find out all the wrong things that they're doing, so you don't have to worry about them. Just smear the independent guys who are actually trying to do their job. That's what's going on in this country. <laughs> All right, just when you think, oh, that's bad, I got another one for you. So, uh, the SEC tried to pass some reform in the Dodd-Frank bill, uh, where they said, you know, in my estimation, incredibly weak legislation, saying, hey, banks, could you, for example, if you're gonna do derivatives trading, could you at least let us know what the trades were? We're not saying don't do it, we're not really even giving tough requirements on it, we're saying, pretty please, can you tell us what some of the trades were? And we still haven't gotten that, and a lot of the rules have been delayed for six months. Well, they did have one rule, though, and it was um, on behalf of shareholders. And now this is really interesting, because shareholders are the ones that are supposed to own the company, right? So what the SEC said is, in applying Dodd-Frank, hey, maybe the owners of the company should get the vote on who's on the board and who runs the company a little bit more effectively than they do today. Oh, no, 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 we can't have that. Now, you see, Corporations will fight that first, and they did. They went to court on it immediately. Why? But theoretically, shouldn't they want to represent their owners? No. It's because the executives that are in charge of the corporations that hired the board of directors, who then hired the executives, are robbing the shareholders blind. They don't want that scam revealed, because if the shareholders, the owners of the companies, actually want to take the money instead of the executives, well, then the executives would get less money. That, no, but right now the executives say, oh, my board says I am so important. You had to give me a $10 million compensation package and a $20 million golden parachute because I am so important to this company. The board of directors I personally handpicked told me that. Oh, the owners want that money instead of me? Oh, no, 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 we can't have that. So they immediately attacked it in court. And what happened? The court said, nope, because of a 1996 law, uh, we cannot have that rule go into effect. Why not? Why, should, why can't the owners run the companies? No, because of... Here's what it says in the 1996 law. Uh, SEC is required to promote, quote, efficiency, competition, and capital formation. Okay, do you know what that means? You know what capital formation means? That means they have to make as much money as possible. So if the SEC prevents any company from making as much money as humanly possible, well then the rule's gotta go. 
So, for example, how, how do they justify it in this case? Because the owners would get more money. They say, no, trying to figure out how the owners are going to influence the board and the executives, well, that requires an extra nickel and a dime to put together more sheets of paper and to get a little larger room when we do shareholder meetings and you write out a couple more outlines. No, that's going to cost us like $5.25. No, it says you can't impede my efficiency, competition, or capital formation. I'm sorry, that's got to go. And a federal appeals court agreed. So that's it. If you're a shareholder in a company, you have no rights. If it's a large state pension that puts money into that, well, it could be a fireman's pension, it could be the state of Alabama, it could be anybody. You have no rights. The executives can rob you any way they like because the court just said they could because of a 96 law that says basically you can't regulate these guys at all if it costs them a nickel. You want to hear how it gets worse? Of course, it always gets worse. For example, blood diamonds, things like that, can you regulate that at least to say, hey, you know what, can you, if you're going to chop off people's limbs to get diamonds, can we at least find out about it? Oh, no, 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 no. That would cost me money. They're suing uh, to make sure that doesn't go into effect. Last one, this is one of my favorites, and there's a million of these. Whistleblower complaints. If a whistleblower shows that you're doing something wrong, like fraud, something that's criminally wrong, no, can't have it. Well, obviously, that would cost me money. If you found out I'm a criminal, of course, yeah, that would cost me money. So, no, the, we're going to bring that to court and say that will uh, hurt our efficiency to have whistleblowers actually tell the government or the press uh, about what criminals we are or what kind of fraud we're doing on investors or shareholders or clients or customers. So, no, you have to erase that law as well. So, whatever tiny little reform got passed in Dodd Frank is going to get wiped off the record books because of this 96 law that they got passed through their lobbyists and all those appeals court judges nominated, most of them, a lot of them, certainly by Republicans, some of them by Democrats, to say, absolutely, Mr. Corporation, you're not just a human being. You're not, you don't just have the rights of human beings. You have extra rights. You have the right to make as much money as possible and commit as much fraud as you like and make sure that the owners of the company don't even see any of it just as long as the executives get that much richer. That's the system we have. Fundamental corruption. You want to see a great example of that? Bart Chilton is a guy who is actually trying to do the right thing. He's a Democratic commissioner at the SEC. He's the one trying to push forward and actually say, hey, wait a minute, we got to get this under control. But he had a great quote at the end of this New York Times story. And, it, and I think he summarized what's going on in Washington perfectly. Listen to what he said. Quote, there's an old saying in Washington that if you're not part of the solution, there's plenty of money to be made being part of the problem. Nailed it. That is exactly it. Sometimes I get discouraged. We got to throw this whole system out, man. We got to overturn the apple cart. These guys are, you know, in a revolving door of how to screw us harder and get richer and richer doing it. And, and you know, look, Democrats are horrible. I've gone over it a million times. But every Republican, every stinking one of them, with the possible exception of Ron Paul, can't wait to give these corporations every single thing that they want and make sure they rob the middle class to do so, and investors and shareholders. Look, I'm going to take a break here. When we come back, we're going to do some lighter stories. Christine O'Donnell works out of an uh, interview. That's great. Uh, dingbat that she is. And then... All this is bad. Wait till you get a load of Rick Perry. If Rick Perry comes in charge, it's over. O V A H. Okay. Then we. I mean, there's no hope in any kind of politics if Rick Perry wins this election. I'm going to show you exactly why when we come back. All right, back on the Young Turks. Uh, we've got a lot of great stories ahead for you guys. Go. Three years ago. Um, 21-month-old Cannon Tipton uh, was a little pint-sized preacher, okay? He wanted to preach in front of his uh, church. Now, keep in mind that his father is a preacher, so he grew up, well, he's only 21 months old, but he saw it his entire life. Mm. Now, he's completely mimicking it, and it's hilarious and scary at the same time. All right, let's watch. Uh-oh. <laughs> 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 
in Jesus' name. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Is he even saying words? I don't think he's saying words. He's only 21 months old, but he's mimicking, you know, the gestures and everything right. that the preacher does, right. which is scary, right? Because yeah. he's only 21 months old. To, so, to see him do something so passionately uh -huh. creeps me out. But then, <laughs> but then at the same time, he's so little and cute. Right. So, like, you can't help but laugh, and you can't help but love him a little bit. No, no, there's nothing wrong with it. He yeah. learned what his father's doing, and it's funny and everything. Uh, but it's funny uh, what a reflection it is yes. of the adults, right? Because the adults go, ah, 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 right? <laughs> But it gives you a sense that these preachers are, in essence, entertainers. You see what I'm saying? They're yes, putting on yes, a show. Yes. And it, the, the words don't really matter. The 21 month old figured it out. He's like, what matters is that. <laughs> so it was cute and, uh, and a little telling of the adults, at least. Yeah, it is definitely telling. Um, I just, I love how animated he is and like yeah. his gestures are the best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ah! <laughs> like, just calm down. But that's how you get people riled up, you know, know, and get them excited about the Holy Ghost. Say it with me, Jesus! Okay, I have something here, but I can't find it. All right, anyway, before we move on, a little quick note here. Um, you know, today I was reading about the Christian Dominionists, okay? Mm -hmm. And Michelle Bachman is definitely one. Rick Perry appears to be one. Uh, and these guys are lunatics who want to take over the government, and uh, they call it the Seven Mountains. They want to take over not just the government, but entertainment and all the di these different fields, and they believe Christians should be... Uh, ruling the world, mm -hmm. and the non-Christians obviously shouldn't, okay? Uh, very, very scary stuff, and I have some quotes that I'll maybe do on tomorrow's show for you guys to give you a sense. But you know who started the whole movement? R.J. Rushduni, which a lot of our viewers probably do know, right? Because mm -hmm. I've seen his name come up a, a great number of times in the articles that I've read. So I was like, Rushduni, Rushduni, that's kind of an interesting name. So today, for the first time, I looked it up to see what his background was. Is he Armenian? No, because I was thinking, like, is he Arab? But that would be kind of ironic, wouldn't it? You know, to have an Arab leading this thing of, like, Christians Domination. dominating the world. Right. right. No, it turns out, you're right, he's Armenian. Oh, great. You know, Armenia was Give me the world's. A break. <laughs> I didn't mean that one, but that's all right. Armenia was the first uh, Christian nation in the world. Mm. Like there was Christianity, obviously prior to Armenia, but Armenia was the first recognized Christian nation, yeah. which is fine. I mean, whatever. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, that's the kind of thing that the parents tell you, like, because they're so proud. Mm -hmm. But what does that really even mean? I mean, was Rome a Christian empire? Does that not count? Because, but. Mm. Armenia was a Christian nation. I'm kind of skeptical. You're skeptical. Okay, but anyway, he actually, his family came from Turkey. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, See? Right? So, <laughs> unfortunately, we unleashed this upon America. But together, you and I, from Turkey and Armenian. Uh, and his uh, parents apparently had, or his family had been living near, uh, at the base of Mount Ararat for 2,000 years. Oh, right? Really? Uh, but then that guy is, first of all, the dominionism is horrible. Second of all, uh, he justifies slavery. Uh, oh, come on, just stop talking. Why are you talking about this? Yeah. Why do we need to inform people about this? It's embarrassing. Another l guy on the list of Armenians with... <laughs> don't get me started. By the way, can I talk about Christian domination for a uh -huh. little bit? Yeah. I don't think it's going to work. Oh, really? Oh. Whew. No. Okay, but we dodged a bullet on that one. <laughs> Why? Look. Uh, not only is it not going to work now for the short term because all of these political candidates are crazy and people can see right through them, but because religion is something that's really fading among new generations. Like people in my generation, uh, people in future generations, they're becoming less and less religious. There's actual data that shows that. Right, so definitely. Is your Christian domination going to work? Doubt it. Yeah, uh, uh, no question. Uh, and a Christian right does not poll well at all. So, and now there's a new story out that we didn't do today about how the Tea Party is actually 
another way of saying Christian right, that they're almost the same people. We didn't do this story because I didn't love the numbers behind it. I, mm -hmm. I, I wanted it to be better. I wanted it to be a more solid connection. But the general idea was that, uh, is that these guys, the guys who say they're Tea Party, they've been tracking uh, people for uh, since 2006. There's a story out of the New York Times. And th they're the same guys who've been filling out the questionnaires. Now, it's a little questionable because it's just a few people that they're polling and then applying to the group, although polling works. Blah, blah, blah. You see that I have some questions about the numbers. But anyway, the, again, the general idea is is that that they're, it's just a proxy for religious people, uh, Christian right, right? And it's a tiny... It's not a tiny percentage of the country. It's just like a s solid chunk, but it's about 20%. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the other 80% are, aren't buying it. And that's what uh, Anna's uh, alluding to. And that part is true. Right. And so, I, you know, it gives me a little bit of hope that that Rick Perry stuff is not going to play well in a general election. So let's hope. On the other hand, George Bush won. So, all right, what's next? Uh, parents in New York are losing custody of their kids if they get caught with a small amount of marijuana. Now, hundreds of parents have been investigated by, ch by the child welfare system if they find marijuana. And what happens is the kids are taken away from them. They're being investigated. And if they do not pose an imminent threat to the children, in most cases, the kids are brought back to the parents. However, you're seeing more and more cases in New York where parents are getting caught with marijuana. They have no prior criminal... Um, criminal uh, record. record, nothing like that, but they lose complete custody of their children. Okay, now one example of someone who did not lose custody of her kids, but had to go through obstacles just to get her child back is Penelope Harris. She's from the Bronx. She was found with 10 grams of marijuana, which is about a third of an ounce. Okay, and uh, what happened to her was uh, she was investigated. Her own boy was taken away from her. Um, the boy wasn't returned for a week while investigators gave her a, a drug test, looked through all of her stuff to make sure that she didn't pose a threat to her son. The son was returned to her. However, she had a niece living with her. The niece was taken away from her and placed in foster care for over a year. Even though she had no criminal record, she didn't have marijuana in her system, it turns out that her uh, boyfriend, her live-in boyfriend, uh, had that marijuana for personal use. They told her, look, we'll give you your son back if you promise that you get rid of the boyfriend. He never comes back. She listened to them. She complied. She had to go through therapy. Even though there was no drugs found in her system, it's I, I, insane. I, I know people who have worked in social services in L.A. And when it happens in Beverly Hills, because you think people don't take drugs in Santa Monica or Beverly Hills or Brentwood and all the nice places, of course they do, right? So they start the investigation. Those people show up with lawyers. They immediately end the investigation. When it happens in Compton or you know other parts of South LA, they don't show up with lawyers and they go, okay, that's it. Good luck to you. This, 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 and this. Okay, and then you got to go through all these procedures. You get your, sometimes you get your kids taken away, etc. Taken cetera, away et cetera. for life, like you're. If you, you get the wrong custody. person, you know, if you get the wrong person, a lot of people understand the dynamics at at hand. But some people are like, nope, that's the rules. That's the rules. Oh, there's a lawyer. Oh, forget it. We're not going to do it. Okay, because they run away from that. That's how being rich helps. She's a, a woman from the Bronx, and she had a little a marijuana. The over. The child w welfare system in New York is actually being harder on people who get caught with marijuana than the actual legal system. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the rules and the laws in New York are not that harsh, which is fascinating. Another thing that I found interesting, and this is uh, something that was uh, mentioned by the New York Times, they say overall the rate of marijuana use among whites is twice as high uh, than compared to blacks and Hispanics, right? However, um, the, the white people who get caught with the marijuana never get prosecuted, never get investigated. All of the cases that we're talking about now, or the majority of the cases we're talking about now, are black or Hispanic parents. Right. Look, you get those uh, disparities partly based, based on stereotypes, partly based on income, partly based on all these things, but in the end, who gets screwed? Uh, minorities get screwed in this case. And then if you point that out, they go, oh, you're whining about race. Yeah, but when somebody's kids get taken away, when they shouldn't have gotten taken away, that's not whining. That's, hey, that's a real problem we got to address, right? I mean, think about it, right? I got a kid now. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I'm, I'm not a big pot guy. I think it should be legalized, but I, that's an ideological thing that I have. It's not like I'm one of those who are ad advocates who want to make pants out of hemp, right? I, I don't care, right? I, it's, not, it's not a personal thing for me, right, mm -hmm. in that sense. But I've smoked pot in the past when I was younger, right? Just like, hey, I'll try it. Why not, right? 
So that's no big deal. If I tried it today, when I got a kid, what, that's it? They're going to take my kid away? Are you kidding me? Yes. I would be in a rage that you could not control. In some of these cases, you don't even need to be caught with pot, okay? In a lot of these cases, if you have admitted to smoking pot in the past, they can investigate you to make sure that you are not a threat to your own children, that you are, <laughs> you are not neglecting your own children. All right, so if I'm 41 and I smoked pot when I was 25. Uh, we gotta take Prometheus yeah, away. Yeah, well, we gotta look into it. Man, that makes me so angry, man. What kind of a bizarre, horrible police state have we become? Man, if only there was a piece of shit with a flat top and gap tooth, a Harriet Tubman-like figure that could come and rescue black folks from this injustice of <laughs> Democrats controlling us plowing a fucking plantation. Where is that motherfucker I can slap? <laughs> Uh, no, 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 Alan West, I'm sure, cares a lot about this. He's spending a lot of time working on these issues. He went down to the Bronx to make sure to, she, to get to her kids back. Like he could give a flying... <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that's such a great point by Jerry. On which of these issues is Alan West working on? On which one? Name it. Anyway, all right. <laughs> I had no idea I was going to get this angry at this show. Okay, but a lot of stories have ticked me off. All right, what's next? Jessica Beagley of Anchorage, Alaska, has an unusual way of disciplining her son. Now, she confessed to the way that she disciplines her son on the Dr. Phil show, and she got a lot of criticism for it. So we have that video for you guys now, and then I want to have a discussion with you as to whether or not she did something that could be considered criminal. We will have that discussion. We will have that discussion. Let's All right. Watch. Burning hot sauce poured on a seven-year-old boy's tongue. Open. Close your mouth. Followed by a freezing cold shower. You are to do what you are told. Punishment from his own mother for throwing pencils at school and then lying about it. Jessica Beagley, his adoptive mother, sent the video to Dr. Phil for a segment called Mommy Confessions. We have tried timeouts, spanking, a lot of different things. I don't know what to do with him. But now she may end up being punished. Viewers flooded the Anchorage okay, Police so Department, where her husband is a patrol officer, with calls clear. after the show aired. Beagley now faces charges of misdemeanor child abuse. Nothing that Jessica has done is uh, criminal. If you give your child food that is... Uh, that has hot sauce on it. Uh, maybe they eat Mexican food. Does that mean it's child abuse? Yeah, no way. Not guilty. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to say not guilty. Criminal charges are ridiculous. Child abuse charges are ridiculous. You know, you're a parent. I think you should be able to punish your child in any way that you see fit, as long as you're not physically harming the child, okay? Cold water, it, it's going to be uncomfortable, but you're not going to kill your child by making them take a cold bath, cold bath or cold shower. I wouldn't discipline my kid in that way, but who am I to say how she can discipline her kid? The thing that I found weird was that his punishment was being video recorded. Mm. Why was that being recorded? Isn't yeah, there's strange? something wrong with our culture, man. I mean, it's almost like, and why would you even want to go on national television uh, yeah. to do mommy confessions about how you abuse your kid psychologically? Look, I'm with Anna. Of course, I, you don't do that to a kid, right? I mean, you heard the screams coming in when he, he, the cold water hits him. And by the way, that's not going to make him act any better. It's going to make him act up even worse. So stupid in 18 different ways. But it's not criminal. I mean, we can't get into every household and be like, well... Now, I didn't like what you did there. The what, temperature of the water was a little too low or a little too high. Or the, 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 no, no way, it would no be way. Different. It would be different if, if it was like scolding, like hot water. If it caused physical damage right. to the kid, then no question, that's child abuse. And we, you know, then you go to get them. But if there's, no, if there's no physical damage there, you can't get into people's parenting like that. But it is sick that she taped it. She taped it, She went it, on yeah. TV to almost get famous for this. There's something wrong in the culture, man. Of course, it's criminal. Are we, are we serious? Are we serious? Really? About this? Well, just it. because he doesn't have some some welts left on it. Okay, say a kid gets his ass flipped with a belt. I got spanked growing up. I never had any marks or anything because it wasn't like vicious. But at the same time, I'm not out to spank my kids. The thing is, is if it doesn't last forever, if you don't have cuts on you, it doesn't eliminate it. Well, actually, it might be worse that you have psychological problems because you think, do you want the cold shower? He wasn't in there to get clean, and he wasn't eating hot sauce to to have dinner. It was for punishment purposes. So he's thinking, oh, my God, I'm about to get something. Yeah, like, you're not going to fuck with them. Me. You're not. You're, it's crazy. They, get, they got people you know, for marijuana possession we were just talking about. Yeah, I think that's and then, stupid. And, then, and now and now that you're actually, your kid is losing his mind. It's like fear. You don't know where I to know. go. It's, I know. We hate that kind of parenting. But that's not, I mean, 
It's a difference between we don't like it and we would like to put you in jail for it, right? Like, so what are you going to do? Go back and put your parents in jail for whooping you? Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, we're saying only if it's, like, some kind of, like, uh, physical abuse. And the thing is, it wasn't because I wasn't getting my ass whooped, you know? But the thing is... There, is actually, this is a, there actually is a rules on this, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And it, it varies by jurisdiction. But largely, generally speaking, it's if there are bruises, right? Then you can say, all right, uh, if it's a closed fist... You know, you can even hit with an open fist. Uh, and there's places you can hit and can't hit and stuff. Now, to us, hitting with an open hand, it sounds terrible to me, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a reason why they have these rules, because a lot of parents do discipline by spanking on the ass or whatever it is, right? And they don't want to arrest people for parenting that they disagree with. Now, this case seems extreme. I know why you're yeah. bothered by it. We're all bothered by it. But I still wouldn't it's call it like, criminal. It's another kind of torture. It's like, can you drip water on his forehead? You know, it's, it's <laughs> fucking with him. It's, it is, but I, no, I, I, okay, well, look, we're two to one here, uh, Chief Justice. Um, I, I mean, it, it's tough, but at the end of the day, you can regulate that. Yeah, they, there is a line you can't cross as a parent. Like, you definitely can't cause physical harm, as, like you're saying, that it's going to cause, like, bodily damage. But, yeah, at the end of the day, you can't be telling each parent how to discipline their kid. Yeah, three to one. Okay. JR loses. Rare loss for JR. I just wanted to say real quick, though, if if you want to investigate her, you know, maybe look into her uh, parenting skills, maybe talk to the little boy and make sure that he hasn't been physically harmed before, then that makes sense to me. But criminal charges, I mean, think about our overcrowded prison system. Think about the resources uh, that we have to look. use to imprison this woman. And by the way, there's a huge chance that if she is found guilty of child neglect or child abuse, she might lose custody of the oh, child. Oh, no question. Are you kidding me? Then she'll lose the kid. The family's going to get broken up. Now, Justice Jackson, it's a good thing you lost on this She one. adopted that kid. She did adopt that kid. So? so what does that mean? Yeah, so you're going through all this, all this process to give a child that could go to a family that wants to treat him correctly and not fuck up his brain. And when he becomes a serial killer, we're like, what happened to him as a child? How did this happen? Man, somebody didn't like the beatings they got as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's the thi no, that's the thing. That, in my opinion, that, wasn't, that doesn't screw me up. I'm a normal person. My brain, when I see my parent, I don't go, oh, my God. This kid is, <laughs> this kid is screwed up. He's afraid of his mother. I was never afraid of my parents. So when your parents came after you with a belt, you were just like, all right, I'm going to take it. You had to, right? You're chilling. You're gonna get two little <laughs> pops on your on your butts, like, like move on, get the hell out of here. And then, so then, if you if you are getting, do you want the hot sauce? Open your mouth. No, swallow it. Swallow it. Get in the shower. It, uh, damn. Like, Look, it's like you're putting, it's like you're walking the plank, she, dude. She said some intimidating, scary things to me when I was a kid. I definitely got a, my fair share of corporal punishment. I'm fine, and, and I think One some of the Was it well thought out torture <laughs> tactics? <laughs> uh, all right, all right, all right. We're all clear on this. Forward. Actually, we've got to take a quick break here. Super quick break. We'll come right back.